Right. Um, it's four o'clock by my by my reckoning. So I think we'll we'll get started. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me and um, that there isn't any problems with sound. So we'll get started. Welcome to today's talk. Um, for those who don't know who I am, I'm Paul Lakin. Um, I'm one of the barristers at King's Chambers who is part of the probate team. Um, and so I'm a specialist as are all the members of the probate team essentially this is what we do. Um, today is part of the ongoing series of talks that um, the probate team are doing. Sorry I've just got to admit everyone at the same time so um, if I appear distracted every now and then I apologize. Um, this is part of the the ongoing series that um, the probate team are doing on a bi-weekly basis although i think faye's got a talk next week on the new emergency legislation that's coming out about um wills uh, so that might be something that people want to look out for and then i think there's a talk the following week as well so uh, they're coming thick and fast at the moment um today's talk as i'm sure you are aware is concerning rectification of wills. Often in these talks we do things fairly short and it's um, punchy but it doesn't give time to really deal with anything in a great deal of depth. Today I hope just to go cover things slightly more thoroughly and then we can see where we can get to and uh, just gives a chance to, to look at a topic in slightly, as I say, in slightly more depth. Now if I can just share my screen we can get going. Right, um, just so that you all know, you're all on mute and I'd be grateful if you just stayed that way, it just makes life easier for me. Um, if you've got questions, if you can use them during the chat function, that'd be great. Um, and again, or email me later, Um, at paullakin.kings or at the, either of my clerks who are Louise and Luke um, and I'll more than happy to deal with any questions after. Even though I'm doing this talk for about half an hour time is going to be slightly tight so there might not be a great deal of time for um, questions at the end. So let's if we get on with the fundamentals in terms of what is it that we're talking about when we're dealing with rectification. Rectification is normally defined as um, amending the, oh sorry, where the terms of a document fail to reflect the agreement or the true accord between the parties, then a court will rectify the document so as to make it um, accord with the common agreement or understanding. So in other words, it is making the document fit the agreement, not changing the agreement in any way. And that's always been the basis of rectification. Now, the rectification of a will as a unilateral document is slightly different. And of course, what the court is concerned with there is that it, they will rectify it if it's shown that it doesn't accord with the intention of the person making it. So obviously you don't have two parties to make that common agreement and so common mistake and those kind of matters that are in contractual rectification don't really arise. Um, but by and large it's, it's the same kind of process that we're concerned with. Now I just want to have, even though this is more of somewhat historical interest only, 
I do want to have a look at the common law position, which is a position really before uh, Section 20 of the Administration of Justice Act came into force, because it was generally considered um, that there was no jurisdiction to rectify a will by inserting words or modifying the language used in a will. What the only exception to that was considered that there was a uh, the court could omit words from probate if they hadn't been included without the knowledge and approval of the testator. So the only basis upon which, or supposedly the only basis, was that if the if the testator didn't have any knowledge of the words used, they could be omitted. So there was an omission part, but there certainly wasn't supposed to be any adding. This was found to be by judges. Um, to be unsatisfactory and limiting when there was cases when there was clearly mistakes made within the will. An example of that is a case called uh, in Re Morris, where what had been missed out was a Roman numeral behind number seven. So in effect, what happened was the codicil deleted an entire 32 different gifts when the intention was only that one should be should go but the court said really i don't have any power to insert the roman numeral which would make sense of this all but what the court concluded was that the mistake was a a, a mistake because of simply down to what the solicitor had done and to follow the language of section 20 it was a clerical error and so that allowed the court, because it had nothing to do with the testator, to add the, the number that was required. So when we come to look at section 20 of the Administration of Justice Act, it's important to understand where it's come from, because when the Law Commission looked at this area, these concepts don't simply spring out of a vacuum. They are concepts that the judges have used and understand and have used in a particular way. And because of that, it colours the way that, that they interpret the act and goes forward. However, much of that changed, I think, and is changing because of the Supreme Court in Marley and Rawlings that sort of reset the dial, so to speak, and said, well, actually, no, it needs looking at afresh. It's not limited by this notion of this narrow exception to this blanket ban that we had before. It's got to be looked at in a far broader scale. So on the screen you've got section 20 which is the power that the court has and you can see that it falls into three simple parts. The court's got to be, decide that it fails to carry out or the will as it is currently expressed fails to carry out the testator's intentions so that requires the court to assess what were the intentions and how are they expressed in the will and whether there's a difference between the two. And if that difference arises because of a clerical error or a failure to understand the testator's instructions, then the court can make the necessary changes. The court now has power, whereas before it only had a power to omit, it can now add words which have been missed out. So this is a, in that sense, it is a completely new power, well, I say new from 82, to what existed previously. And then you have the uh, limitation period that it has to be brought within six months from uh, date of representation, which I'll come on to in slightly more detail later on. There is a limit on this power, and this is again, is a slight hangover from the concepts that I was talking about. Because what it doesn't give power to do is to uh, remedy where words have been used and been specifically chosen, but they've failed to understand the legal effect of those words. So in other words, if one of the cases, one of my cases I, a few years ago, the solicitors had advised the client it would be sensible to do some IHT planning in terms of how uh, his will worked. The client had clearly accepted that advice um, and they drafted it according to the instructions. The problem is the solicitors had under misunderstood 
the way that the IHT Act worked. And so there was, there was no failure to understand on the part of the solicitor. And the words used were precisely the words that were intended. The, the problem is that they all misunderstood what the legal consequences were. So that isn't a case of rectification. That's just, a, unfortunately, a case of negligence. Um, and um, the solicitors eventually just had to inform their insurers. It doesn't create or can't create certainty as to the meaning of the intended words. That's the matter of construction. Construction and rectification are the yin and yang. How far you can go with construction is an interesting point, but that's probably for another day. Um, but strictly speaking, one of the things that the court has always got to do is determine what the will means. But that's construction, not rectification. It won't also deal with a situation where there is a lacuna in the will, where something has arisen that was simply unforeseen by the parties at the time that the draftsman drafted the will. If the testator never applied their mind, and because the events just weren't foreseen, or uh, then again, rectification is unlikely to be an answer in those circumstances. So that limit has to be borne in mind. It is only within these two narrow parameters of whatever they mean, and they've been expanded recently, that you are going to get the benefit of uh, rectification. Now, what's the court's approach to this? The court's approach as uh, Mr Justice Chadwick, as he was then before he became Lord Justice Chadwick, pointed out that the court needs to deal with this in basically three stages. The first is what were the testator's intentions? Okay, that's what he's got. The court's got to determine that. Secondly, the court has got to decide or got to determine whether the will, as it is expressed, um, carries out or fails to carries out those intentions and then thirdly whether that is as a result of one of the two limbs in the act and that in order to answer those questions the court must was the word used admit extrinsic evidence of the testator's intention with regard to the relevant dispositions so here what the court is uh, the court is driving at fundamentally is what are the testator's intentions. So there's clearly a need for evidence to deal with that point. This is one of the fundamental differences between construction and rectification. Construction under the classic view, subjective intentions are irrelevant, save in wills you've got section 21, which admits uh, in, in a limited number of circumstances. But if you don't fall within section 21, then there are no subjective intentions at all. Whereas here, in a rectification claim, that is the heart of, what ev of the evidence that you will need to lead. But there is, of course, one fundamental thing, as Mr Justice Norris <laughs> explained, that you need to do before you get on to looking at those other points. And that is, of course, you've got to understand what it is that the will actually means, because and again, this is why there tend to be, you tend to have a construction case and a rectification case, because the first stage is to work out what does the document as it is drafted actually mean and actually do. In terms of what weight of evidence is required in order to establish whichever head you are going under, Judge Hodge, in the case of Slattery and uh, Jagger, makes this point. Now, Judge Hodge, you have to bear in mind that Judge Hodge, especially when you read this quote, is the author of Hodge on Rectification. Um, so you, when I read this part out, just insert available from all good bookshops after Hodge on Rectification. This is also one of my cases. Um, I was involved in this. Um, I acted for the defendant in this case. Um, but it's a useful point that the judge makes, and it should be one, particularly when you're preparing a case, to be borne in mind. And basically, the point that the judge makes is, it says, the authorities are considering and analysing the paragraphs 10 to 12 of the forthcoming 
second edition of Hodge on Electrification, brackets available at all good bookstalls. Although it's interesting to note, he quoted himself from a book that wasn't even out, as if that somehow meant it was had carried more weight, but there we go. Um, but the point he's making is really, the more obvious the mistake, the more likely that a court is to grant rectification and the less cogent, because there's often this, uh, this word used as the co you need cogent evidence in order to um, persuade a court that what this position is wrong in some way, but the more obvious the mistake, the less cogent that evidence needs to be. And the greater the evidential weight will be given to evidence that points that something has actually gone wrong. This also comes to another point that I'll just mention in passing now, in that the courts can look at things differently from an omission, which is often more obvious because something has gone wrong, because a word tends to stop and then carry it on again, to where there is, uh, where you're asking it to delete words. In other words, where extra words have been added. There you carry a higher evidential burden to establish that those, the extra verbiage wasn't really there to do something because this comes back to that central point that if you choose words but it just simply doesn't do what you hoped it would do that's not rectification so there's this interlocking concept of how much evidence is required against how obvious a an error the court is looking at so once you've dealt with matters evidentially, the question arises clearly, what is, the, uh, what is a clerical error? And the, uh, this is a quote from uh, Marley and Rawlings, where the Supreme Court said the best judicial definition up to that point was um, from Mr. Justice Blackburn in Bell. The essence of the matter is that a clerical error occurs when someone who may be the testator himself, or his solicitor, or clerk, or a typist, writes something which he did not intend, or inserts, or omits something which he intended to insert. The remedy is only available if it can be established that the will fails to carry out the testator's instructions, but also what those were, which is a very good point. So you've got to establish what those instructions were, that it wasn't, that the will doesn't carry those out, and that it was because something happened. So clerical error is basically your classic typo, you copy and paste from a precedent that something's gone wrong, or you alter something in a precedent and don't reword it, or you don't follow a, a definition through. All those kind of things are clearly clerical error. But then we come to Marley. Marley, as I'm sure you all know, was a case of mirror wills. And what happened was husband and wife executed the wrong wills. So the question was whether or not that kind of error could in fact be described as a clerical error. And the, and the Supreme Court simply said, yes, why not? Um, they weren't worried about the old verbiage that came out of the pre-Section uh, 20 cases. They were just looking at it going, look, this is for a purpose. It's designed to solve these kind of daft problems that arise. Therefore, it clearly is. Um, and their reasoning is encapsulated in the phrase there. There was an error and it can be fairly categorized as clerical because it arose in connection with office work of a routine nature. Accordingly, given that the present type of case can as a matter of ordinary language be said to involve a clerical error, it seems to me to follow that is susceptible to rectification. So simply handing the wrong will to a person was a clerical error. So clearly, as I say, all those cases where words are missed out, words are added, words are, uh, precedents are followed that are incomplete or a, a will is amended and things aren't followed through, all those are capable of being uh, a clerical error. Um, yeah, it, again, this is just a continuation of uh, what was said in Mali. 
and again it makes it makes the point failure to understand there are most of the cases and most most of the cases i've ever dealt with fall under uh, have been clerical error cases there tend not to be so many failure to understand cases because they tend to be far trickier waters that you get into um, one is that it is understanding which is a, a point that's made in this quote it is not the implementation that fails and the two have to be separated out because this is where again people tend to get this wrong in that they think oh well it's gone wrong therefore we can rectify it and that's just simply not the case if you have understood what the testator wanted but you have simply the choice of words that you have made fails to do what the testator wanted then that's implementation rather than understanding and so again uh, that doesn't work so Pengeli and Pengeli was a an unopposed application and this is something again I'll come on to in terms of the practice part of it just because uh, an application for rectification is unopposed it does not mean that there may still need to be a hearing where matters are argued because this is a one of those areas like um, seeking declaratory relief where the court has got to be happy to make the order that is sought and has got to be persuaded that it is right to do so in the circumstances so as i say even where there is an unopposed application you can still end up with full hearings full judgment and uh, matters going forward although pengeli was i think done on paper so there's some saving there um, the reference that's referred to into mr justic mr justice chadwick is in re siegelman which is talking about the, the same thing um, you'll see that there the distinction which underlies the third of those situations which the judge identified also note the passage was referring to instructions of words into a will rather than the omission of words from a will it seems to me there is a potential distinction to be drawn between a situation in which an error occurs alleged occurs as a result of the inadvertent omission of a word or word rather than inadvertent inclusion of a word it seems to me that where a word or words have been mistakenly omitted different considerations arise and there may well be greater potential for characterizing the error as one of a clerical rather than of a 21-1-B. So what uh, Judge Hodge was saying in that is, it's more likely that if a word has been missed out, that that is more likely to be a clerical error or is easier to classify as a clerical error. Where you have extra words, that's much more likely, well, it can still be a clerical error, but is more likely to be categorized as a failure to understand or more readily fall into that and there might be different considerations um, practice the time limit as is in uh, 22 is six months from grant unless you get permission the sorry let me just go back Ooh, hang on. the um where you need permission the test is by and large the same as you would get under the inheritance act it's exactly the same test it's been lifted and applied so anyone who is familiar with uh, that the test for applying out of time under that act will be familiar with this test so it just simply makes it's an unfettered discretion you have to explain why it should be more brought out of time and you must consider whether the applicant has acted promptly whether negotiations began within the time limit whether the estate's been distributed would dismissal of the claim leave the applicant without resource and is there an arguable case there is however a very recent case this year where master schumann in the case of kelly and brennan 
said yes that's fine that's the that's broadly the test but it has to rem be remembered that there is a distinct difference between um, a claim under the 75 Act which is basically a hostile litigation in which a, either a third party to a will or a uh, somebody is who has a benefit under the will is seeking to substantially enlarge their entitlement so uh, is looking to do that and a claim under section 20 where the court is really dealing with what is the meaning of it or what should this mean if the court intervenes so again what master schumann said is that the court should be more flexible when it comes to dealing with uh, an application under section 20 than perhaps it would be under 75 so things aren't quite as aligned as perhaps some of the earlier authorities suggested um, although he uses the phrase driver coach and horses through testamentary int intention for the 75 act that uh, seems quite a excessive view of it but there we go um, so th the upshot is you, you you're more likely to get a favorable view on, a, on an application to uh, extend time for section 20 than perhaps you would under uh, the 75 Act. But again, that is no real reason for delaying because you don't want to be caught. So practice. Usually they would be brought by part seven. You can bring them by part eight if there's no dispute or they're in effect by consent or unopposed. Um, but otherwise, normally part seven. They would be usually brought in the High Court. The County Court has very limited jurisdiction. It's possible to shoehorn them on in, but again, sensible thing is started in the High Court. It's easy to transfer down if everyone agrees or the judge, that's what the judge wants to do. And it's probably worth pleading construction and first and rectification and the alternative. That's the usual method. The court is going to have to, as we've seen, construe the will anyway. So um, it may well be that it comes to the conclusion, as has happened in a couple of my cases, that you don't even need to bother with rectification because the construction works anyway. So, um, and then go, well, I don't know what you're all worrying about. So plead the two together. There, may be, there are sometimes cases when you just simply don't and it's clear that something's gone wrong and you need to rectify. So evidence, as I say, bear in mind what it is that the courts need to determine. In other words, what are the testator's wishes? Does the will carry out those? And if not, why not? It's important in terms of T's wishes to set out, therefore, what instructions the solicitor gave. So this will normally require a statement from the person who drafted the will and which leads me on to the next obvious point but you'll be amazed how many solicitors have drafted the will as is often the way they have made or they have suggested and the testator has agreed that the firm or a member of the firm should be executors so you have the firm who drafted it as executors who are then pursuing a claim in rectification. Now, and it is amazing how, to how many, how few, the obvious conflict of interest simply doesn't appear to, to uh, occur to them. But there is no getting away from the fact that because of the very two narrow limbs upon which rectification can be made by the court, that something has to have gone wrong and usually that something will amount to negligence. So if you are the firm who has drafted this will, whether or not you've got good intentions, it can lead to a reluctance to perhaps take it quite on the chin that it would do, which has led to cases I've been involved in, one where they wouldn't give any early disclosure, so we only discovered what had happened at disclosure which the judge criticized heavily and one um, a case in Birmingham we only discovered how it was actually said that a clerical error arose 
when I cross-examined the drafts person in the witness box. Up until that time, the only thing we'd got from the solicitors was it was a clerical error. As you can imagine, the judge wasn't awfully impressed when it came to questions of costs, but I'll come on to that. So it, it, it is something that needs to be borne in mind. My position is that in this kind of case where you are dealing with litigation, it would be sensible that a third party solicitor, one who was not involved in the drafting of the will, should conduct the litigation on behalf of um, the executors normally. And then the question is, is, is it a case of omission or deletion because of the questions that, different questions that may arise because of the two? And again, how obvious is the mistake? In other words, how cogent is your evidence going to need to be? How hard are you going to need to work at persuading the judge that this will, something has gone wrong with the will? and that it doesn't represent what the testator wanted. If it's painfully obvious, you may not, you'd be pushing at an uphill door. If it's a slightly more nuanced argument, then you might have your work cut out and you might have to get the partner to, um, or whoever drafted it, to be slightly more open with what has or has not occurred and how it has occurred. Costs. Um, as it says there, it depends on all the circumstances, of course. The costs ultimately are in the discretion of the judge, so it's entirely up to the judge to do as he or she feels fit. Possible orders are normally the usual order following hostile litigation, loser pays, all paid out of the estate. The second option is all paid out of the estate, which is the classic construction one. If the construction is just, it's nobody's fault, the will isn't clear, um, and the stance that everybody's taken is reasonable, then it may well be a case that everyone should be paid out of the estate. Of course, if you're acting for executors, they will be entitled for an indemnity from the estate as long as their actions are reasonable. And normally, if it's a case of rectification or construction, there's not going to be any great argument as to whether, in pursuing that kind of case, the executors have acted reasonably. The third option, which is again, why there can be a real problem if it's the same firm involved who was involved in drafting the will is that all the fees should be paid by the solicitors responsible for the mistake and so given that there's a possibility that they could be picking up the tab they shouldn't really be the instructing solicitors at the same time because as, as i say there's a clear conflict of interest you could never be sure that they're making decisions for their own benefit or for the benefit of their client. And then, of course, the possibilities are any of the above. In um, Marley and Rawlings, I think the Supreme Court said basically the um, solicitors insurer should pick up the tab for everyone simply because it was a very small estate that accepted liability. It was their mistake. Um, so they got the job of that. Oh, hello. Right. There we go. That is essentially where I am up to. And it's now, I think, 34 so we're pretty much on time which is bad so i hope that's been of some use um as i say i'll have a quick look at the chat i don't think there's anything there's a long one but i can probably deal with that separately so i hope that's been of some use um as i say next week phase doing a talk on the emergency legislation that's going through Parliament regarding um, witnessing wills. So again, I think that's, that's probably a, a very useful topic. And then there's another talk a week later. So I hope that's all been of use. And if you've got any questions at all, just send them to my email, which is plakin, no dot, uh, at kingschambers.com.
and I'll happily get back to you with any points. Okay, many thanks, and I think we'll uh, end there.